but we were preparing for Hurricane Harvey. And uh, we bought a tarp the length of the house. And Hurricane Harvey just ripped that up like mincemeat. And so it rained in on us. No organization in Houston would help me. I had given up several times. Nobody's gonna help me. I told him that nobody's gonna help me. There were times when I thought I would never. I would never. I just I met James uh, it, was a, it was a February morning and, and then James asked me was I affected by the flood and I told him I was but I said my mom took a hard hit when I met James and Julie I could see the expression on James face too <laughs> Said, it's not gonna happen. I'd say, you know, she's right. People tell us this. And then I get a call from James, and he tells me he's coming over. James come, and he go in the house. And you told him, you said, wow, this is a lot. <laughs> I said, wow, and, and it's a lot. And I can tell you my thoughts at the time were, I can't do this on my own. And I can tell you for sure, it was gonna take God to get through this, this project. Oh, what didn't they do? They help with the walls, with the flooring, with the lights, everything. I have a house now. The Julie, I remember one day walked around and she made a list and then called the church, called Jermaine the next morning. And Jermaine said, there has been two families from church that just donated some things. And it was exactly the list had been donated by people from the church. It's incredible. A lot of people have come through from the church, and a lot of people have really, really supported to get this done. And then here, here come Julie and James, and they're pretty church. And I will never stop thanking God. So we're in this season where we're stirring our faith to be a, a movement of the gospel in our community where it makes a huge difference in the lives of people because we know that is what the gospel is. It is the power of God. It's supernatural. It is the power of God uh, toward everyone who believes, for salvation to everyone uh, who believes. And so this was uh, Patricia's story is a part of that because we're, we're, we're doing these two Sundays, last Sunday and this Sunday where we're just sort of lifting up these 10 big things that we think God has called us to, to be the gospel movement in our community that we think he's called us to. And so right now we're in a kind of a phase of time where we're working on about four of those and we really talked about them and celebrated them last week. And so if you weren't here, just really quickly. Um, so here, here's what God's led us to and what's happening right Right now, we've been able to launch a gospel-centered counseling center, which has been amazing in the last uh, 24 months or so, much greater and larger than anything that we thought would actually happen. Someone told me in the last eight or nine months, there's been over, uh, over 1,400 hours of gospel-centered counseling that has come out of that. And think of the life change there, people who are hurting or up big life questions or difficulties or wounded and we're able to speak the gospel uh, into their lives that's just been amazing and then a significant Spanish language ministry we talk about that a lot God's doing some great stuff there it's so explosive I mean it is ministry on steroids and it's it's absolutely amazing and then uh, a third then expanding our reach to the next generation this is where we need a lot more work and passion and resourcing so there are 10 
count them, 10 6A high schools just in our ministry area, our immediate ministry area. That's 30,000, maybe more just high schoolers. And there is the most unreached generational group in America, high schoolers. And so we have a passion, a heart for the next generation. We have so much we need to do there and resource that. And then, and then we had a fourth, and that was strengthen the life of our church. And we mean strengthen, strengthen our church family financially. But it wasn't four. It wasn't just four. Those were the four planned. And then August 26, I think it was 26 last year, then we launched the unplanned one. And that was... Uh, Hurricane Harvey relief. It was the unexpected one, the unintended one, uh, the unplanned one, and yet, here's what's so amazing about Patricia's story, and there are hundreds more just like her. This is the initiative. This is the gospel initiative that you, church family, you, Bear Creek family, you just exploded on it, and just did these incredible things. I mean, honestly, supernatural level things that I'm not sure I've ever seen just in a local uh, congregation. Um, you were instantly in over a hundred homes cleaning them out and mucking them out. You gave more than a hundred or almost a hundred thousand dollars just instantly in cash and gifts and uh, other things in order to help people. We have 400 families with care packages, big care uh, packages, and so much more. It just goes on and on and on. But every single family we help is a family like Patricia's that they could see the gospel in the most unmistakable way. So on the one-year anniversary, this August, on the one-year anniversary, August 26th was a Sunday, and I was in the lobby, and a young couple uh, in, engaged to me and said, hey, uh, you know, we're new here. We don't really go here. And uh, we, we, you guys, your church just helped us when the, when the flooding came, our house is in Bear Creek in one of the Bear Creek neighborhoods and you guys just came in and without being asked, you cleaned it all out and you helped with a lot of the restoration. We couldn't have done it at all. It was just mind blowing to us and we just keep thinking about it. This is one year later. We felt like we would come today just to find someone to be able to say thank you and and, and I, I certainly accepted that. And then they said, because here's the deal. We don't really, like, believe in Christianity. We, we don't really value the church uh, at all. But, um, but we just can't stop thinking about what you all did for us and why you did it. And we had this, like, really really great conversation there in the lobby for a few moments and if you think that the end of this story is that then we bowed in the lobby of the church and they prayed and received Christ it was, is actually not what happened but what I did see happen was this this perspective this narrative about Christians in America get knocked down in their life that they're nothing but hypocritical bigoted you know religious snobs that's knocked down in their life their experience is well that's not true and I think the Holy Spirit is working in their lives and drawing them to him in an unmistakable way. And why? And why? Because a fellowship like us said, we're going to be hands and feet, and we're going to be the gospel of God in our neighborhood, and we're going to sacrifice for it. And, and here's, here's what won't leave me right now, is how, how could we duplicate that? Because you, Bear Creek, Sacrifice more than I've ever seen you sacrifice. Give more than you've ever given. Serve more than you've ever served. And did it with such incredible joy that it's honestly at a level of like supernatural reality. And so the question is how? How could we reduplicate? How could we duplicate that uh, uh, and, and, and repeat that again in all of these things that God's called us to do, in all the ways that he's called us to be a gospel presence in our community and I, I you know of course I wrestle with that question and and I think I have an answer my best answer it's really simple it's so simple but my best answer to that question is how could we duplicate that here's how it's just found completely in the way that you gave yourselves to it 
that you gave yourselves away to it at every level of who you are. And I think I found those principles in a single passage of Scripture, the principles that cause us to give ourselves away really at a supernatural level. I think I found a, a passage in the Bible that shows us what those principles are and shows us the spiritual practice that stimulates that. And I want that in my life. And I want it in your individual life. And I want it in our, the life of our congregation. And it's going to be sort of surprising and it's going to be maybe unexpected, but it comes out of an Old Testament passage in, of all places, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. One of, the, one of the Old Testament law books, of the five Old Testament law books. So Deuteronomy 26, we're gonna, I'm going to read the Word of God to you, and it's, it's a lot of verses, 10 verses, but I just want you to really absorb it and seek to understand what it's saying before I'm even finished with the passage. So here's the Word of God. And so the Bible says, beginning in verse 1, it shall be when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance and you possess it and live in it that you shall take some of the first, some of the first of all the produce of the ground which you bring in from the land that the Lord your God has given you and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God has chosen to establish his name and you shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, I Declare this day to the Lord my God that I have entered the land which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. And then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. And then you, you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down to Egypt and sojourned there. Sojourn means to live as an alien. And we were few in number, and he became great and mighty and a populous nation. And then the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us, enslaved us. Verse 7, and then we cried to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with great terror and with signs and wonders. And he, he brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 10, now behold, I have brought the first of the produce of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me, and you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship before him, worship before the Lord your God. These are 10 verses of command. Uh, this passage is a command from God to his people about how to worship him. And worship him, worship him at the level of how you serve him, how you live for him. And so I know it's an Old Testament passage, and I know a lot of people have a lot of confusion about what in the Old Testament applies to the New Testament and what still applies and, you know, what flows through. Let me just tell you about this passage, cut to the chase. This is an eternal, this is an eternal principle. This is a once and for all principle. It's a principle that was practiced before the Old Testament law, a principle during the Old Testament time, and a principle you can find all through the New Testament. And so it's this command about how we worship, and it's, this way, this way of worshiping that could absolutely reignite and ignite in the freshest possible way our desire, our desire to be a sacrifice for God. And so get the context. Uh, 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 ancient Israel was like this agrarian uh, uh, community. And so, and so where was all of their wealth? All of their wealth was found in the crops they raised. And so it was very basic. <clears throat> their food, their most basic needs came from each little plot of land that they lived on. And they didn't get paid like you and I get paid. Currency was not highly developed in ancient Israel at the time. And so, and so they didn't get paid at the end of the week or twice a month or at the end of the month. They got paid at the end of the year with their harvest. They were paid by the end of the season and their harvest 
And so there's this big idea that's formulating out of this passage that actually, that actually communicates, translates in 21st century New Testament Christianity, and it's this. Look at what's going on here. God makes a declaration in this passage that's timeless, that it's for your life and mine. And that declaration is this. God says, I want you to put me first. Did you really have to come to church to hear that God wants you to put him first? It's something you, like, already know. But look what he says, and I want you to demonstrate it. And here's how. I want you to demonstrate it over and over by giving me your first fruits. Now, what does that mean? And what is he calling on us to do? And so God said, here's the principle. Here's the principle of worship that I'm giving you, and that is give to me first. And then after that, pay your bills, put up savings, buy the things you need. And so it's a principle of giving, actually, that's all over the Bible. It, it, it appears at least six times in the Old Testament law. A, a lot of scholars think that this offering, this offering of first fruit, was the offering that Cain was giving God, that pleased God, that made, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, Abel gave, that Abel gave, and that Cain got, Cain got really jealous over and, and uh, hateful over and killed his brother. And so it's like this timeless sort of passage. It's even found in the worship uh, and the wisdom literature, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. For instance, in Proverbs, here's wisdom literature. Look, it says, honor, honor the Lord from your wealth. And how do you do that? From the first, from the first of all of your produce. This passage says there's a reason for that, so that your barns will be filled with plenty. It doesn't mean that God makes you rich. It means that God will provide in your life. And so there are these there are these reasons, there are these reasons that the principle of first fruit giving should be all over our lives. And I want you to absorb them, really grasp them. Because here's what happens. These three qualities that first, that the, that the, that the spiritual discipline of first fruit giving brings into our lives, it develops something in us. It's these qualities that will make your heart strong and resilient and growing and sensitive to God because here's the deal without these three qualities something happens to your life here's what I think happens to your life you'll decay you'll be hollowed out before you get, the, uh, get to the end of this life without these qualities resident and growing in your life you need them you need to practice them you need the spiritual practice that stimulates them in your heart and life. And so what are they? The passage tells us. It just lays them out for us. And so, so first fruit giving is a spiritual practice. It's like reading the Bible or praying or simplicity, any other spiritual practice. First fruit giving is a spiritual practice that does this, number one. It creates a heart of sacrifice. Here's why the principle of first fruit is all over the Bible because God knows something important that you know too, but you and I don't want to admit, and that is that money has a power over us. Um, but it's not because money is either evil or good, either one. It's, it's neither. It's just a thing. But money's power is found in what it does to the human heart. In fact, here's the principle. Money... Money just does this. It just magnifies what's already in your heart. That, it, just ampl it just amps it up. Whatever is already there, money empowers it. It amplifies it. For instance, if your heart is turned, if your heart is like turned to yourself, money will just magnify your self-absorption and, and make it more massive. If, you're, if you have a tendency toward pride, uh, money will just make you harder uh, and, and blinder to yourself. Is blinder the right word or more blind? Anyway, if you find a lot of security in possessions or significance in the right car or house or neighborhood, money's going to amp that up tenfold. You could have lots more money and be much poorer because of it. 
And so, and so God knows that this, God knows that his chief rival God, his chief rival in our hearts is actually money. How do I know that? Jesus said it himself in the Sermon on the Mount. And so, and so it can easily become the source of, of uh, the source to where we look for security and for safety and for significance and for satisfaction. What did I just name? I just named the four God functions in your life. The, the things that you look to an ultimate reality for, to an ultimate creator for, that is significance and, and safety and security and satisfaction. They're God functions in our life. And God knows, God knows money is his chief rival for that. And so God does this. God, so God says this, the way to keep money from controlling your heart is to offer to me your first fruits. I want you to give to me first, he says. And I think that means first in time and first in priority. That, that it means that, look, here's what it means. If you live your life this way, I get paid. So I go and I pay my bills and then I buy groceries and then I buy some clothes and then I pay for some weekend entertainment and then I go for a little two-day getaway and then and then I give some of what I have left over for God yeah you know you know what happens there's nothing left over for God and if there is what has God gotten your leftovers and so here's what happens Here's what happened to so many of us last year when we faced the reality of the flooding all uh, around us. Uh, we just, you just immediately, you just immediately unleashed sacrifice. It was honestly, I think, at supernatural uh, levels. Reality became very clear to you in, in that moment that helping others in our community in the name of Christ is the most important thing. And it was so important. It became so, so important. It was way more important than your Netflix you know, subscription. It was way more important than the stuff you were going to order on Amazon. It was way more important than a little weekend trip that you had planned. And, and it, it, <coughs> it took over. It took priority over over even your essential bills. You were saying, yeah, this is more important. I'll figure the other out. That's the principle of sacrifice found in first fruit giving. How do you like the sermon so far? <laughs> Let's keep going. It makes your character strong because it builds a kind of resilience in you, the kind of resilience you need to keep from being hollowed out at the end of your life. It builds a spirit of sacrifice in you, essential to your character. Number two, this spiritual practice of first fruit giving, what does it do in us? It creates a heart of sacrifice, but then secondly, it connects two things. It connects them together. It connects grace and gratitude together. That's, that's what the practice does. Every spiritual practice has a, a benefit in your life. It grows you in some way. It does something powerful in you. And, and the, 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 the practice, the spiritual practice of, of first fruit giving is that it takes grace and gratitude and welds them Together, And that's what's going on in verses 4 and 5. I love what's happening there. You, you see that, you, that the person has to take this gift in a basket, large basket, actually to the priest, hand it over to him. And the priest takes it and he puts it before God um, uh, at the altar. And so I love this. In the Old Testament, you weren't allowed to, you know, drop off your um, offering in, in the Old Testament. You couldn't just drop it in a receptacle you know, in the lobby. Uh, the giver had to take it personally and hand it to the priest for the priest to put it at the altar before God. And then what? And then, and the giver's not through. He couldn't just, then he had to do this, verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. The giver was required to actually offer a testimony. He had to declare something. And what was that? Well, verse 6, you have to say this. You bring this before God, and then you have to say this, verse 6. My dad was a wanderer that became enslaved in Egypt and was afflicted. Verse 7, then you had to say, but we cried. We cried to the Lord, and the Lord saw our affliction and our oppression. Then verse 8, you had to say, and then the Lord liberated us with a mighty hand. Then verse 9, you had to say, and he gave us this incredible place to live that is fruitful and blessed. 
What is all of that? What, what is that? That is a testimony of grace. And this is, that's what it does in your life so that you will continually live in the awareness of it. First fruit giving, giving God first, giving to God first, whatever comes into your life is, is a way of channeling week after week, month after month, year after year, over and over and over on top of one another. God, you've been good to me. God, everything in my life is because of your grace. God, you do nothing but bless me. And so verse 10, it goes on, which you, which you, look at the testimony, which you, O Lord, have given to me. I set it down before you. Now, and then it says worship before him. Do you see what's happening there? You were never allowed to, in the Old Testament, just to give. You had to link up what you were giving to God's goodness to you. You had to link it up with his grace in your life. You had to link it up with God's provision in your life to the fact that everything you have is a gift from God. Because, because if we don't live out that practice, we forget it. And if we forget it, then we'll, then we'll tell ourselves lies about it. We'll start believing the lie that I worked. I mean, this is scraping against our, our flesh, right? <laughs> hey, I worked hard for this money. You don't, uh, I got the worst boss on the planet. I had to work 60 or 70 hours last week, and I'm underpaid, and I worked hard for this. And, and God says, yes, you worked hard for that. And you say, I was smart enough to create this wealth, and, I, and I'm in charge of my own life. And, and, so, and so you just you start with the smaller lies, those smaller lies, but then they'll grow larger because, you know, you must be in charge of the global economy. You, you must be in charge of where you were born and in, in charge of the time uh, in history that you were born, and you're in charge of the fact that you have good brain tissue and that your body works. Oh, except all of that's a lie. That it's all from God. Your ability, to, your ability to tolerate your boss and to work 60 or 70 hours is given to you by God. And so all of it, all of it is a gift of grace from God. And so to put God first every time you're paid produces the most amazing heart attitude of all. Contemporary social scientists will all agree to this, that it will create this attitude, it'll create this virtue of gratitude in you, which will change your life. Your level of well-being will go off the charts when grace and gratitude get linked together. And how do they link? God, I give my first over and over. I give it always to you because everything I have is a gift from you. That's the second thing it does. And, and so what are we doing with these? Why are these important? These are important for this reason. You don't bring these qualities into your life, you're going to die hollowed out. But, but these three qualities produced makes your life flourish. Who you are, flourish. There's a third. Won't be hard. Number three, fills you with joy. The the spiritual practice of first fruit giving fills you with joy. So this occurred to me in chapel this morning, the early service, 815 service. And so I was working my way, and I got to this again, fills you with joy. And it just suddenly dawned on me, why is it? Why is it that almost every major concept that you and I go through together, we teach you, any big concept, that it seems to always end with, and it gives you joy. It might be that... God created us for that. It might be that you, you are created by him for joy. And, and here it is again, verse 11. And you, along with the Levite and the alien who is among you, shall rejoice in all the good which the Lord your God has given you in your household. Well, why, why should the principle of first fruit giving be in my life, it is so that God can produce joy in your life. At the end of it all, God says it should give you joy. And, and when you work your way through the Bible, joy and giving are always connected. 
here in verse 11 rejoice in all the good that God has given you uh, in, in Jesus parable uh, about the three servants uh, the master gives them wealth in order to invest for him and then he comes again and the faithful ones when they give him all that they've done the, the master says well done good and faithful uh, servant you've been faithful in a little now enter now enter into the reward no Enter into the joy of your master. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, the largest portion of the New Testament talks about our giving back to God. Uh, Paul, as you know, is, he's raising an offering for famine relief in Judea, and so he's going across the Roman Empire doing that, and so he's telling these Corinthians, these rich Corinthians, he, he tells them at the beginning of that, that chapter that the poor, impoverished Macedonians, when they heard about this offering, they exploded in joy that they got to be a part of it. Here's the greatest joy, I believe. When you give first fruits as a spiritual practice to God, and those, and that giving gets converted into gospel outreach, it gets converted into the gospel, and then people's lives are impacted and then changed and then transformed, never to be taken away. That is joy that lasts forever there, there's no substitute joy that that uh, compares to that there's nothing that can compete with that there's no extreme adventure there's no pleasure there's no vacation spot there's no nothing that can compare to the joy of seeing the gospel change people's lives radically and it's because you resourced it and here's the challenge for our our church family we have 10 big things that we believe God's called us to do and to be in our community and we're working on four of those right now and we need and we need to strengthen those and we need to resource those and all that all that inhibits all that drags on it is is uh, our our willingness our openness to just give to it and so I want to challenge you to that church family here's the deal if I wanted the very best for you, if I wanted provision in your life, if I wanted grace and joy for you, you know what I would call on, uh, on you to do? Give first fruits to God and watch it explode in your life. It's a crucial step in putting God first in giving to him first. I'm gonna ask us to bow together